Good morning, church family. How y'all doing? Welcome to week three of our series on identity. And um, really, when discussing identity, there's no more valuable resource than Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. It's so good. It's chocked full of answering questions on our identity. In fact, the first two chapters answer massive questions. Questions like, you know, who we were and, and why we needed to be saved. Uh, it also addresses how we were saved and, and, and what we were saved to. Two weeks ago, I asked you, I said, how is God moving in your life? Tell me about the stories God is doing and working out in your life. And the response was amazing. I had to start putting them all in a document because I was just losing track of everything. So I got this document that says God is moving and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. I'm going to share more at the family meeting in a couple weeks about just exactly how God is moving in this body. But I, I just want you to know that I'm praying for you. That I'm praying for each and every one of you that responded and, and our pastors and elders were praying for you. We want to walk with you. Okay? We, we want you to be known here. And so please know that. We love you. Um, but Ephesians also explains some of the blessings that we receive through Christ. And folks, we, gotta, we must never forget that Jesus made it clear this life is not going to be easy, right? But when we keep our eyes on heavenly things, when we keep our eyes on the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ that we've received as believers, then the challenges of this life, folks, they become light and momentary. Like, this is not a problem. In Matthew 22, Jesus is asked about the law of Moses. A lawyer asks, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus continues, he says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So Jesus quotes the Shema. It's a compilation, a compilation of Deuteronomy 6 and Numbers 15. It's easily the most quoted and well-known passage in Judaism. In fact, in Jesus' day, every faithful Jew recited the Shema twice a day. But here's the thing, okay? Reciting something might check the box of with all your mind, but that's about it. It's, it's, it's a head thing, not a, not a heart thing. And that's what I want you to see. Because a, a lot of believers, they're doing the same thing today, right? They're running around, they sound like Jesus, but the heart is not involved. See, I want you to see that, that your pursuit of God is extremely shallow if you don't first understand your true identity in Christ. So Christ comes. He, he stirs our affection for God, and Jesus transforms forever how we see God, how we see ourselves, and how we see others. So unless you understand your true identity in Christ, you cannot love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and you certainly can't love your neighbors yourself. Now, don't get me wrong. You might be able to perform it, you might be able to pretend it, but that's going to get exhausting. See, unless your identity changes, you'll never find joy in it. And before we get to Ephesians 2, I want to remind you of your true identity. You know, <laughs> look, I can lay out the truth for you, but I can't make you accept it. I can, I can tell you eternal truths from the creator of the universe, but let me warn you ahead of time, your instinct is not going to be to accept those things. It's actually, as Romans 1 makes clear, you're more likely to suppress that, not to accept that. Paul also teaches that everyone is without excuse. So it, the argument that scripture makes is that God has so clearly revealed himself in creation that all men know he exists. No one has an excuse. Now, there are really three ways God reveals himself to us. First, creation. I mean, just look around, folks. <laughs> just look at the world, look at the things around us, and, 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 and we can see how it works, we can see what's in it, and we can learn a, an incredible amount about God just by looking. Now, the atheist cracks me up here, right? The, the, see, the atheist only has to believe in one Miracle. In fact, that's their big selling point, right? They're like, well, well, with us, you only have to believe in one miracle, just without God. So there's no miracle worker. And you might say, that's easier. That's just one. Yes, but there's no one to perform it. At least Christians, we believe, yes, in many miracles, and, but, at, but at least we believe there's a God who performs them, right? And so, so we can witness God around us, and we can witness God within us called our conscience. 
And so we have this little invisible compass in us that helps us determine right from wrong. Right? So, so God's law isn't just, it wasn't just handed down to us, uh, handed down to Moses on, on two tablets, right? It's also evident in his, mo- his most precious creation. Now, granted, some are better at ignoring that compass than others, and if you have confusion about that, again, I would direct you back to Romans 1, right? Some became fools, and their hearts were darkened. So, so God reveals himself in creation. He reveals himself in our conscience, right? And finally, my favorite, he reveals himself in in his word. And so as we read God's word, which has somehow amazingly been preserved for thousands of years, as we read his word, the truth is revealed to us. See, God ensured that's how that would happen. God ensured that the truth was written down according to his will, and he's maintained it through the years. Blows my mind. And so as we read his word, and as we, as we hear the word, and, and we hear teaching and preaching, we can come to know who God is. We can come to know who we are. And most importantly, we can can know what God requires of his most precious creation. God is awesome, and he is holy. I love that word, awesome. I I don't think we really understand. The origins of that word, awesome, they're pretty cool. It comes from the phrase, true awe. True awe. So it's really a word that we should reserve only for describing God. God is awesome, and he's holy. Holy. He is holy. Leviticus 19 says, Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And some of you smarty pants Bible scholars are like, Josh, wait, we're not under the law. True, but his law still matters. Grace isn't to be turned into lawlessness. Holiness mattered to God when he spoke that to Israel, and it matters to him now. I mean, certainly we see that, right? In Matthew 5, when Jesus urges the believer to be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Or how about Peter? He says, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, he's about to quote Leviticus, look at this, be holy because I am holy. So we are not only image bearers, but as his adopted children, we are called to obey his commands and be holy as he is holy. Be perfect as he is perfect. Be merciful as he is merciful. And I think that right there, is where people get hung up. That's where we struggle. Because we know that to be holy, there's going to have to be some serious rearranging going on in our lives. That's my hope for you today. That you would see that. See, self-evaluation, I think, is an, is an often undervalued Christian discipline. Right? And it's, but it's massively important in our pursuit of holiness. Um, the other night, I text my wife. She was out on business and she was in Colorado, and I, I texted her, and I said, I said, how do you, babe, how do you think I'm doing at leading our home it, it, to, to, to love God, to obey God, to, to, to fear him, to, to know his commands? How am I doing at teaching you about God? How am I doing teaching our kids the commands of God? And, I, and I'm sitting there staring at the three bubbles awaiting her response. They, they, they call it three bubble anxiety. It's a real thing, three bubble anxiety. And I'm just sitting there, I'm like, all right, I don't know what's coming. And then, and then I called myself out on that. In case you don't know, I'm, I'm my worst critic. I'm so hard on myself. So I called myself out on that. I'm like, do I wait for God to speak like I wait for my wife to text? I, did, I started preaching to myself. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm in bed. I'm supposed to be off and start preaching to myself. Like, I, I recognize that, that, that I have a really bad tendency to make requests of God and then just go about business as usual. I'm like, well, you know, he's God. So, you know, I'm sure he'll interrupt me when he's ready. No, like wait for him. When was the last time you waited on God? So I'm waiting on my wife to text back. And I'm wearing this heavy because I, I, I know, and, and I know sometimes, ladies, this isn't necessarily a popular thing to say, but men, God gave Adam the command, not Eve, for a reason. I believe as men, we are called to teach our homes the commands of God, and not only to teach, but to display a life dedicated to godliness. So folks, in order to rearrange your life, truth is you might need to start by repenting to your family but for a lot of you that's step one repenting to your family one of the most amazing and most liberating things that you can display for your family is that daddy and mommy need grace too i need grace too 
My family and I were driving to Tucson this last weekend, and I asked my family, I said, do you guys see the same man on stage at church that you see at home? Now, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but that's a, that's a, that's a pretty bold question to ask. I'm like, I don't know. Let's see how this goes, right? So Madison said, yes, no doubt. I was like, yes, got one. My wife said, yeah, yeah, no doubt. Yes, this is going really well. And my son said, well, <laughs> except for when we play, play Rocket League. Now, some of you are like, what's Rocket League? It's when you try to play soccer with cars on, on an Xbox. It's dumb. But we're, so we're dying laughing as a family, right? But Nolan was right. See, one thing that you can't see about me when I preach is that I'm extremely competitive. I hate losing. And so we actually had to remove Rocket League from the Xbox because that game was desanctifying. It was like, get it out of here. Get it out of here. Like, and, and, but, but it's the truth. I think for many Christians, the tool of self-evaluation is buried way too deep in the toolbox. We don't ask enough questions of others about how we're doing. But it always comes back to identity. There's a reason we don't ask. We're not secure. See, I am secure in Christ. I can let you know how I've lost my temper to, learn to learning to play soccer with a car because I know I've been justified. Because of Christ, God looks at me as if I'd never sinned. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm a new creation. I've received God's righteousness as my own. I have unity with Christ and with all believers. I'm adopted. And my sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus and I've been forgiven and the Lord has given me authority to preach and proclaim him to be king of kings and lord of lords in the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Folks, is alive in me and I have the power to say no to sin and walk away from temptation. And I can approach God in prayer with confidence because of Christ. The spirit of God within me, folks, it drives out all fear and it replaces that fear with power and love and discipline and God calls us to hold holiness. Listen to me. God calls us to holiness, but then proceeds to give us exactly what we need to pursue it. He is so good. He is so faithful. I walk by faith in the one who loved me and gave himself for me. But I didn't always walk like this. I was very different before. Let's look at Ephesians 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Okay, real quick. You were dead. Who is Paul talking to? A non-believer or a believer? A believer. See, Paul's giving a quick recap of what the believer was before, right? You were. You, you, you were this. You were that. You, 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 you know what you were, right? Like every believer can fill in the blank behind that, right? You were but I want you to hear today that our identity doesn't have to be determined by what we were. That's what I want you to hear today. See, depending on our past, though, depending on our past sins and some of the stuff we've struggled with, that's going to be harder for others to release than some. It'll be harder for you to embrace that identity because the stain of your sin can sometimes linger, right? It can follow you around. It can lurk, right? Some of you, you may never be able to completely separate from it, but nevertheless, his grace is sufficient. And here's the problem. When a relationship goes bad, we often assume the other person is the problem, right? I mean, we would never tell them that. That would be cruel, but that's how we see it. Now, I know that some of you have been married for 10, 20, 40, 50 years. Praise God for those long marriages. I, I, I celebrate that with you. But, but can we just go back to young you for a second? Raise your hand if you've ever heard these words. It's not you, it's me. Yeah, I'm not going to make you raise your hand if you pulled that nonsense. But if you're a victim of it, yeah. And, and I just, I, I, look, I hate to be the one to break it to you, but it was actually you. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, but my, it's, <laughs> my wife and I, we do a lot of marriage counseling, and I don't think anyone has ever come in and said, hey, I'm a mess, and I'm jacking this whole thing up, and I need to change now, or I'm going to lose my marriage. No, it's always, she does this. She does that, 
It's always the other person that's to blame. And the, the, the first piece of marital counseling always hits like a ton of bricks. If you want to improve your marriage, then first let them see you're willing to improve yourself. Because we love to blame others for our problems. But God, God is so good. He doesn't play games. And he certainly doesn't sugarcoat it. It's not like, you know, you, you think it's me? Oh, you, you, it's actually, no. God just says, look, I'm not the problem. You're the problem. You're a real problem. You were dead in your sin. That is a massively important statement for us to understand because sin isn't just something we do wrong. It's a condition of our hearts. It's, it's not that we do bad things and then because we did bad things, we're bad now. Like, no, like we do bad things because we're bad. Like we aren't greedy because we steal. We steal because we are by nature greedy, right? We aren't liars because we lied that one time. We lie because we are born liars, flawed, broken vessels. I mean, think about it. It's so, I didn't, I didn't sit my daughter down and say, hey, look, Madison, you're about to be 18 years old and, you know, the world is about to come after everything that I've taught you is valuable in this world. They're about to come after it all. But if you fall, right, if you make a mistake and you don't want me and your mom to know about it, just tell your mom and I the opposite of what really happened. Also, also, the more detail you include, the more believable it is, and the sleepier we'll get, and you'll probably get it past us, right? Like, like and, and she's, no, like, that, she, I didn't have to teach her how to lie. She figured out how to lie because she's a liar by nature. And she's really bad at it, and I praise God for that. I'm like, thank you, Lord, for giving me a bad liar. That's the, you want to pray something as a parent, pray for that. Pray your kid gets caught, or pray they're really bad at lying. But look, don't just skim over this, folks. You were dead in your sin. I want you to wrestle with that because it, it will only build up your praise and admiration for the one that saved you. There's nothing you could do. Nothing you could do. But that's the thing, and that's what's so frustrating. A lot of Christians today, they prefer to think they were choking on their sins. It's, it's a small distinction, right? They, 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 they prefer to think that they can still see that they can still signal for help. And if no one's around, maybe they can lean over the chair and force it out, right? Christians in America, they prefer the idea that there's some way to self-medicate. There's some way to like Home Depot it, right? Like I did a bunch of stuff bad and now I'm gonna do like a bunch of stuff good. And then like I'm in accounting. So I think that that like cancels out. No, like you weren't choking on sin. You were dead in it. You were spiritually dead and could do nothing but be dead, as believers, part of our responsibility is to ensure we never forget entirely what we were. It doesn't have to define us, but we should never forget it. If you forget who you were, then how can you praise God for who you are now? If, if you never speak to others about what God has done in your life, how can the church be built up? How? So in case you've forgotten what it was like when you were dead, the next couple of verses remind us what it was like. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. That's Satan. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So first it says, you followed the ways of this world. Well, what does that mean? Well, I love how John Piper puts it. He says, money, sex, and power are the three towering gods of this age. This is what the world worships. The unholy trinity, if you will. Our world is obsessed with getting as much money, sex, and power as possible. Many think that's the key to living the good life. This world values these things more than they value God. This world seeks these things more than they seek God. But look, these things aren't complicated. I mean, money can either glorify God or become your God. Money altogether is not bad. It's our view of it and our use of it that makes it bad. Now, everyone gets all comfortable when the church talks about money. But look, follow Jesus for five minutes. Look, and I'm not talking about like you follow somebody that follows Jesus on YouTube. Like, no, like actually follow Jesus for five minutes. Like go read his teachings. Go see what he's all about. Follow Jesus for five minutes and you'll know immediately why any faithful preacher won't hesitate to talk about money. 
If I were church shopping, if I were in your position and I were looking for a church, I would go sit under the teaching for three months and if money never came up in three months, I'd be out of there. Why? This is why. No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So for anybody claiming to be in Christ, the question is, how do you keep from making money your master? It's simple. Make your money serve the master. We give because the Lord commands us to give. Does the Lord command you to give because he, he needs your money? No, he didn't need your money. He commands it because he knows that the last thing you need is a master besides him. Sex is the most beautiful, intimate, and private way that you can connect with your spouse. It is a gift from God to enrich and deepen your marriage, and Satan has turned it into a product to be sold. So, I mean, whether it's money, sex, power, influence, I love what C.S. Lewis said, and I think he said it best. These things cease to be devils when they cease to be gods. That's good. See, when power isn't an idol, it can be used to serve God and glorify his name. When money isn't an idol, it can be used to serve God and glorify his name. When influence isn't an idol, it can be used to serve God and glorify his name. Oh, be careful, believer, because the second you won't use what God has given you to glorify him and make much of his name, it's that same moment that that just became your God. So whether whether we've rebelled or simply failed, however it's gone down, we did not love God with all our hearts and we did not love our neighbor as ourselves and we were, some of you won't like this, but there's no way around it. We'll grab the ESV here for the title that we earned. It's especially dark in the ESV. Check it out. We were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. There's the answer to the blank we needed to fill in from before. We were children of wrath. We are by nature flawed and broken. So check it out. We have these beautiful instruments, right? Meant to just play beautiful music to the one true, living, precious, and amazing God, but the musician just isn't cutting it. You with me? No, raise your hand if you love music. All right, let's see here. Hold on, keep them up. I can't see you. I'm gonna pick on somebody. All right, Kelly. Kelly, what's your favorite instrument? Is your name Kelly? Oh, <laughs> so I'm just, I didn't know if we had two Kellys. I'd be like, that'd be amazing. Kelly, I was asking Kelly Caldwell. Guitar. guitar. Okay, all right, so she said guitar for those of you that are online. So I'm sure that that is your favorite instrument, and I'm sure it sounds amazing until I play it. It will no longer be your favorite instrument at that point. I will officially ruin that for you. And it's true, because you can have the most well-designed, like meticulously crafted instrument, but if your musician is bad, the music's bad. I don't care if you hand me Kenny G's saxophone, right? When I start blowing, it ain't gonna sound like Kenny G. Because we are, we are flawed musicians holding amazing instruments but it's so much more than that. It's not just that our music was bad. We actually started playing for ourselves and not him. So we took his creation and we exploited it for our own selfish purposes. And we placed our desires and our glory above his. And we sought to gratify the cravings of our sinful nature. That's what children of wrath do. They satisfy cravings. I'm convinced that yet another tool way too deep in the believer's toolbox is fasting. When was the last time you said no to yourself just to prove that that thing had no control over you? A month? A year? Folks, God's spirit gives us discipline. And we, we talked about this earlier. You have the power to say no to temptation and sin. Are you wielding that power like a samurai? Just turn off social media and grab a book. Grab a Bible. Stop scrolling, start flipping. Put down the wine. Look, nothing wrong with wine. I enjoy a good glass of wine, okay? But if there's a problem, if you can't put it down, so put it down, take a walk. Skip a meal. Skip a meal and sign up to pray 
for an hour instead. Here's the thing about skipping a meal. We just heard from somebody who said that they live in an environment where they don't even know where their next meal is going to come from. The best thing you can do is skip a meal, embrace those hunger pains as, oh my goodness, Lord, you have blessed me so much. Find worship in your empty stomach. After all, how will you know you have the power to say no unless you try? And I know some of you won't like this, but God's children will be marked by self-control. Maybe the best thing you can do is prove to yourself you don't have any. We made gods out of God's gifts and earned for ourselves the title children of wrath. But listen to me. It's going to get good. We got a little more to go. I promise it's going to get good. The title you earned doesn't compare to the title he earned. So hang in there. It's interesting because skeptics of God say, well, why can't God just look the other way? And we get this a lot when talking to people outside the church. If he's all powerful, if he's awesome like you say, why can't he just forgive me? In our culture, they scream for justice but have no idea what justice actually looks like. See, justice promotes equality and fairness. So for God to just turn his back on our sin and not make it right, that would be unjust. Think about it. If somebody broke into your home and stole all your gold bars, would you press charges? You bet you would. Why? Because you love justice. That's why. If somebody cuts you off on your way to prayer meeting, right, you're going to honk. Why? Because you love justice. And you got this nice little justice springer right there. You were wrong, sir. I'm going to let you know about it. When we do it, we call it justice. When God does it, we call it unjust. Hmm. See, because in a legal sense, justice is about defending the righteous and condemning the guilty. It blows my mind that we can accept justice as a term legally, but not spiritually. Folks, we are guilty, and we deserve to be punished, and there is no one to point the finger at. We were, by nature, deserving of wrath, but the gospel is such good news because the truth is really, really bad news. And I know you may not like hearing that you deserve God's wrath, but you need to learn to love those words because it's the truth. And Jesus says in John 8, if you accept these words, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. God's wrath is his perfectly just response to sin and transgression. One way I thought of putting it this week was, was this. God's wrath is his holy impulse towards evil. I love that. But no one ever wants to talk about God's wrath. Yet Proverbs says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Well, well, but we aren't likely to fear God by his kindness. We need to hear about his wrath. See, because if you don't understand who God is fully, you will understand nothing else. But that fact is often left out when talking about God. and We don't want to hear how severely he will punish sin. But we need to. The wages of sin is death. Two deaths. See, death came through sin and death spread to all men because all sin. See, God's wrath is not just some Old Testament tactic. It's not. The, the, okay, so the world turned its back on God and he sent the floodwaters. Right? Sodom and Gomorrah gave up natural relations for unnatural ones. He destroyed them too. But the Lord says he does not change. And we see in the New Testament, we see that play out in the book of Acts when Ananias and Sapphira lie to Peter about bringing the full tithe to the church and they both die. I know it might not be fun, but more Christians need to memorize Nahum. Seriously, when was the last time you heard a pastor like, hey, you, you should memorize Nahum 1 too? This pastor's saying it, you should. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power, and the Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. That is who God is. Please do not confuse, though, God's righteous anger with the earthly anger you've experienced in the sinful behavior of those around you. Okay? God doesn't have mood swings. Okay? Okay? He doesn't fly off the handle and lose his cool on you like he is slow to anger, but great in power and he will punish the guilty. <clears throat> but look at verse four. 
the most amazing two words in the entire universe, but God. But God what? Look. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. Hallelujah. But isn't it crazy how much we struggle to come to terms with our rebellion against God and our title, children of wrath, but how quickly we can come around God's love for us? Anybody else find that strange? Like, we, lo- we, 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 don't, we don't want to talk about justice, but let's talk more about the warm fuzzies. Like, his love and kindness and grace and mercy, that's all the good stuff. That's why I came to church. Unfortunately, this is why way too many Christians have sleepy worship lives and prayer lives. It's either we don't truly care to admit how helpless we were, or we think ourselves so lovable, we believe cultures lie that we are so worth loving that the statement of God's great love for us doesn't seem so great. I mean, look at you. (laughs) You're not that bad. God's love isn't that great because, I mean, you're pretty lovable. But you can't understand how great his love is until you truly understand how far he went to save you from Genesis 3 to Calvary to right now in this room, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That our disobedience took place around a tree, yet God worked his plan of salvation and saw to it that our salvation was completed and finalized on a tree. That God came to earth, took on flesh, and became the Christ Hebrews 4 says we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Yet he did not sin. The blemish-free lamb, the final sacrifice that made a way for us to return to God forever and something amazing happened. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus didn't die for his sin because he didn't have any sin. He died for our sin. Look at Colossians 2. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it all away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Christ paid your debt in full, past present and future sins nailed to the cross so you were who you were no longer matters it might matter to them but it doesn't matter to God Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed me white as snow and it's by grace you have been saved I mean, aren't you tired of trying to be good all the time I, mean, I tried and it was exhausting and I was really bad at it and it seemed that the harder I tried the more epic I failed this time Josh you're going to get it right this time you'll quit this this time you won't let that rule this time this is the last time I'll put that down I'll give that up I'll walk away from this I'll do these things better and all I found was failure and frustration and I don't know how and I certainly don't know why but all I know is one day all that changed And I stopped trying to change and I started seeking him. And I finally realized that he did it for me because I had no chance. I don't need to change. I need Jesus. And you know what happened? He started working on me. And more and more I started to resemble the one that saved me. And I started trusting God and he's still working that out in me to this day. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Did you just see that? Did you see what happened? This blows my feeble little mind. About how many years ago was Christ raised from the dead? Like 2,000 or so, right? After he was raised from the dead, it was about 40 days and he ascended to heaven. 
Now read that. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Say what? According to God, if you're in Christ, you're already seated with Christ in the heavenly realm. When Jesus said, it is finished, he meant it. Salvation has been accomplished. You don't need to fix yourself. You need Jesus. Only he can make you holy. Walk with Jesus. Live with Jesus. And the world gets to witness the song of the redeemed. And you know that's what the church is called to be, right? You understand that is our purpose. And who better to show his grace to the world than the ones who have experienced it? And worship can look a lot of different ways, so I thought we could do something fun together as a church. I just want us to raise up a cheer of praise this morning. If you're among the redeemed, I want you to offer up a shout of praise, and I want to fill this place with the song of the redeemed. Let's go. Let's hear it. Come on. Woo! Like, praise God. Praise God that he saved my soul. Let's go. Let's go. He deserves it all. He deserves it all. He is worthy of all of our praise. He is worthy of our hearts, our souls, all of everything we have to offer. I will not be quiet. I will shout it. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God that saves sinners like me. So praise God. Praise God. <sighs> Amen. Amen. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And faith is actually just trusting God completely. And it's so much more than just believing in God. Faith means that I take God at his every word, that I place my life in his hands. But look what he says about you. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Salvation is by faith, but it always produces good works. Always. Now, people struggle with this, but it's just more loving kindness from God. How tragic would it be for somebody to think that they have saving faith when they really don't? But God clears all that up for us. When you're saved, God remodels your heart and gives you new desires. And listen to me, if your desires don't change, you're not saved. Now, listen. Listen, it's not overnight. But if you, to, if you today looks the same as you from like a decade ago, that seems more like your handiwork, not his. And just like me, you need Jesus. Believe. Give him your heart. Tell him you accept him at his word. Open his word. Pursue him. Read it. Memorize it. And when you start to see him, trust him with your life. And those good works, they'll show up when you trust him. They'll show up in everything that you do because apart from faith, your work is meaningless. But when you walk by faith, folks, your works impact eternity. Your good works are a response to God's good gifts. And it comes by offering your time, your talents, your money, and your entire life to God. It's just you, open hands, saying, God, it's all yours. That's who we are. That's who we are. Let's worship together. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word and your faithfulness to tell us the full story of who we are, who we were, and who you want to shape us to be. You are so faithful to illustrate this for us in your word time and time again that apart from you, we can do nothing. Lord, help this church, lead this church to abide in you, that we would remain in you, that we wouldn't run off on all these foolish pursuits and all these foolish doctrines, but that we would simply rely on you every day, Lord, over and over again, preaching the gospel to ourselves in good days and bad days, that we love and cherish the one that loved our soul. Help us, Lord. We are foreigners because we belong in your kingdom, not this world. Help us to walk well in this world, a way that resembles you, a way that brings glory to who you are. Help us to change this city for the good, Lord. 
Help us lead people to Christ in our workplaces, in our homes. Rescue our marriages that are cracked and broken right now. Bring us back together. I pray reconciliation over broken relationships, Lord. That we would have unity together in the church and in our homes, just as you designed it to be. And that our unity would be rooted in you, in Christ. I love you, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.